it is Tristan with Nerd Out's Newsstand, and today we are talking to the expert. We are talking to the expert of crowdfunding and writing different comic books. I've had the chance to read number one and two, and I will put a link to three for the Kickstarter in the comment section. It is Dark Knight Nation on YouTube, Area 51, The Helix Project on Kickstarter. Tell us a little bit about your book, Trevor, and what makes your book worth backing. Well, thanks for for having me on to, to chat about it. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, Area 51, The Helix Project is uh, just me taking a lot of my experiences uh, as a, you know, I, I went to school, I went to the University of Connecticut for the beginning of my college career for molecular and cellular biology, you know, and anytime I was sort of looking up interviews by my favorite writers, they had always said, you know, write what you know. And I was like, well, I always hate when sci-fi uh, is just like fantasy with a sci-fi skin on it. You know, it's just inexplicable uh, and it's not based. Oh, on yeah. And, and in, in my mind, like if you're going to use science, like let's use some science and use that as the sort of springboard, right, for the the, the fictional aspect. So that's what I did. And, um, you know, I ended up coming up with this story that is this crazy sci-fi conspiracy that takes place in a UFO hysteric America in the seventies, which is also like a socially tumultuous time. Um, and there's this government program called the helix project that, uh, is basically a desperate attempt to end the cold war by using DNA samples from the species that landed in Roswell in the fifties, um, uh, to, to create these bioweapon super soldiers, uh, that are able to manipulate their DNA. Um, but the, you know, at, at the, at the core of it, where, what it all trickles down to, and it asks the questions, um, as to what cost that power comes to at and, and to who, and, uh, that's where you kind of meet our protagonist who is a child of both worlds. And, um, for, for as much as this is like crazy sci-fi and noir, and there's a lot of crime and, and, and tension, like this is kind of like when you boil it all down, it's a story about like fathers and sons. It's a story about identity. It's a story about memory. Um, because to me, like the, the best fiction is just a lie that tells you real things. And that's what we aim to do. And, uh, I have just been fortunate to surround myself with, with ridiculously talented people, um, from all around the world, you know, to help me make this book. And they've been able to take this idea that, that, that started out over a little over a year ago, um, and, and bring life to it. And, and through the process of working with them, I've become a much better storyteller and a much more conscious one. So, um, in terms of what makes it special, man, this is a, it's an indie book with the production value, uh, greater than what you're going to find at the big two. You get a physical copy of this book, man, it's thicker paper stock than what you're finding at either one of the big two. It's 24 pages of actual story, not counting ads because there are no ads, but, um, this is made as not only like a, a creative endeavor, but also as a product that I want to make worth worth people's time and money because uh, comic book fans get abused all the time by the industry that they love. And uh, that's just not something I'm looking to do. Did you say a year? You've put three out in a year? Well, so well, it's, te well, it's, technically been, it's technically been less than a year. So I, wow. um, so the idea is that I, I came up with the idea over a year ago, you know, um, in terms of actually creating the book, you know, you can go back to uh, what would it have been like September, maybe like August, September of last year mm -hmm. when I was actually working on the book. Um, wow. so yeah, we're, you know, I, and I wanted to keep it at a good pace because it is difficult to read periodical stories and not have to go back and reread the whole thing. And, uh, I don't know, I, I'm all about the experience, right? Like as a creator, um, my number one goal is to generate like a positive experience through the storytelling, through the the consumer aspect, right? Like I want people to feel more than happy uh, and feel like they've gotten more than their money's worth out of these things. Uh, that's why I don't really make any money off of this. Like all the money goes into the next book. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to find ways to make sure that this is affordable and easy for people to get into because uh, not only do I obviously want to uh, sell my book. Like I want people to experience this story because it's one that I care about. And it's one that, uh, I, I think is pretty, pretty good, you know? Oh, absolutely. One thing I noticed right away was your use of silence. Thank you. And it almost made it 
at first I was like, this is a, you know, it's a little bit more of a quicker read than mm -hmm. something like comparatively to Bendis or something <laughs> like that. But the use of silence to set the tone made it very intense at the Thank same you. time. You felt the emotion. You mm -hmm. felt that longing for, you know, the father or you felt even the dynamic between the son and mother. Mm -hmm. You felt that love. And that's what I really even though it was, like I said, it was quicker read, but it was a lot more emotionally invested than something you would see, you know, just generally done to put out for a cash grab. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And that was one of the major goals for me. Um, I've, I've talked about it a lot on my channel and a bunch of discussions. Um, and there are a lot of people who are sort of like wannabe uh, novelists that get into comics and right. they over they overwrite the page and you get to the point where you, like you get to the end of the issue and you're like, oh, my God, finally. Like I I'm actually rather happy that that you think it's a quick read because that to me that says that you want more. Um, yes, exactly. And that's and, a, especially with that ending. I'm not going to give it away because I want people to check it out. And you're also on Comicsology too, correct? Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I'll put that link down below also, but I'm not going to give it away. But that ending, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> what? Like, I wanted more. That's exactly what it was. Good. Uh, that's awesome. That's so great to hear. And to be honest with you, man, um, you get into issue three and it's by far the craziest cliffhanger so far. By far. Oh and like, and I'm, love not, it. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not the type to like overhype my own stuff. Um, or overhype anything for that matter. Like you've seen my channel. I'm very sort of critical and analytical. And I mean this truly. The cliffhanger to issue three is um, bangers. It's crazy. Oh, I love it. Tell us a little bit about your team. Now you do the writing, correct? I so do. Tell so us I... about the art. The art, I was so impressed. Like mm -hmm. even going, I I've been very critical of books that I generally love, like Harley Quinn with mm -hmm. artists like Riley Rossmo. And then I go to this and I'm like, this is an indie book and it's fantastic. So tell us a little bit about the other people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, like I said, like way earlier, I'm super fortunate just to be surrounded by incredibly talented people. Uh, my uh, penciler inker is, is a Brazilian comic book artist named Marcelo Salaza. Um, and he has been <laughs> created comics about as long as I've been alive. Uh, oh, so wow. he, has a lot, he has a lot of experience. He's worked with Jimmy Palmiotti and Justin Gray um wow. amongst a number of like um you know crazy indie talents and when i um was sort of looking at folks preliminarily the the thing that really struck me about marcelo and it's something that like a, a lot of readers don't really think about but the way he spots his blacks which is basically a term for saying like he knows how to place deep fields of black uh over the along the page in order to create like a sense of depth and light um and I, I thought it just worked really well for the type of story that I was trying to tell because it, it not only does it contribute to like that visual design aesthetic, but it contributes to the storytelling and the mood. Um, and, you know, he's he's just a, a super nice guy. He's a family man. You know, he's like a, a family of uh, he has four kids and a wife um, and he, he just works really hard and, and is, is has been a great collaborator for me, um, especially given like, you know, the first issue of the helix project was like the first thing i've ever really worked on um so there was a lot that went into that a lot of inexperience in terms of logistics and um you know just uh, it, it took time you know i needed time to grow into the shoes uh, in order to, to to run the distance and so you know he's just been great he's been an awesome uh, an awesome collaborator on this project and uh i'm, I'm really excited for people to read this third one because you know, issue one, I, I think was really solid for a first book. Issue two, I think you could tell that the two of us were really getting in rhythm together uh, as storytelling collaborators. And issue three, man, I feel like is just like, hey, if you guys didn't think we were in sync by issue two, you'll definitely think that now. Oh, that's wonderful. I was, like I said, it, I was quite honestly blown away. Now, when you, you have your own channel, right? Dark Knight mm -hmm. Nation, and you do a little bit of your own reviews, but now you're doing the story of somebody wanting to get into comics. Do you want to tell everybody about that just a little bit? Yeah, yeah, real quick. I also want to shout out my colorist too because uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. I just I I know that you know uh, the the sort of 
support art team doesn't always get uh, all the love and, and man, these guys deserve it. Uh, Marcio Freire is also a Brazilian um, comic book artist. He's a colorist. Uh, and man, the, the dude is just so, so good. I can't say enough good things about him. And not only in the way he just aesthetically renders the page with color, but his awareness of palette and his awareness of lighting and what different lighting is going to do for the scene uh, narratively and tonally. I mean, the dude is, I mean, he's, you know, if this were a film, he's my cinematographer. And uh, he's been such a key, key component in um setting up a sense of mood and and assisting in the storytelling i mean you know when we um not much of a spoiler but in the first couple of issues we uh have these flashback uh i was that, actually gonna say something about that with your color palette in the yeah. in the prayer that mm -hmm. got me oh my Thank goodness you. go that's ahead awesome. i'm sorry no 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 that's so awesome to hear um if you can tell, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy to, you know, just to, to, to be an, a creator and to hear that somebody enjoys the work. So, um, no, don't apologize. Uh, but yeah, you know, we're making very deliberate color choices and Marcio is just the guy to execute it. You know, that was one of the things I knew going into the, the book was that part of the, the noir of this sci-fi noir book was this really sort of crime angle bent tense flashback scene where we're doing gray wash which is you know some people would call it black and white but a gray wash is really just using shades uh everything between black and white subtly as a way to establish like depth and and a, and a, and a sense of light um and uh we use the color red uh some people might be able to draw the conclusion as to why that is as a sort <laughs> of as a sort of accent uh and he's just so great at executing it and and it's it, it'd be so easy to mess something like that up Right. Uh, it really does take somebody who is a master of their craft like Marcio um, to to be able to execute that as well as he did. And I'm so thankful to have him. Uh, he's also he's just super versatile. Like not only does he color um, Marcelo uh, on the interiors and on his color covers, uh, he also covers my variant cover artist, uh, Adrian Bone, who did this image here, uh, which is the beautiful the third issues variant. And he's just, he's so good, man. He just, he knows how to set up a, a story within a singular image based on the way he's lighting it and rendering it and coloring it. So yeah, just wanted to shout that out as well as, as Taylor Esposito, the letterer, who is just an industry veteran. You've, you've seen you, if you read comics, you've seen his name on a book, whether it's Marvel, DC, indie, um, the guy is, just a, a, an incredible man to work with. He knows what he's doing. Uh, and, I, and I'm just so thankful that he accepted um, a project working with somebody like me who had no experience prior. So yeah, just wanted to thank them. That's wonderful. So tell us about your, your new series you're kind of doing on your channel. Yeah, so it's called Chronicles of a Comic Book Creator, where uh, I basically pull back the curtains for uh, readers, aspiring creators, and so on and so forth, to sort of get a sense of what it's like to create a comic book, so like to to really see uh, how the sauce is made, if you will. Um, and and uh, it, the, you know, I sort of want each progressive episode to have a flow, you know, to sort of uh, have it take place in the order of which I feel like people are going to need it, right? So the first episode that launched last week was um, broken up into two parts, and it was really about the idea. Right. And how do you take an idea and figure out whether the idea is a story or just an idea? Um, and then moving further, how do you figure out whether that story is a comic book story? Right. Because you want your story to have media specificity. You want to make sure that uh, the experience that you're curating um, is is designed for that medium to use it to its full potential. Right. Because like the Helix Project. I maybe I could have wrote and written a novella about it. I think it kind of would have been shit, to be honest with you. I think um, you need those, those, like I said, those that use of silence. Right. You had to yeah. have it. You had to have the visual. Right. Yeah. And, and this this story needed to be a comic book. So uh, each week, if I have a sort of specific topic like that, I want to use a, a case study of like an actual known comic book story um, as a way to support my uh sort of suggestion so last week for example we talked about um the original graphic novel pulp by ed brubaker and sean phillips as an example of a story that only really works as a comic book a story that needed to be a comic book and explain why um and then so this week this thursday um i'll be talking about comic book scripts and the different styles of comic book scripting whether it's full script marvel methods so on what type of information a strip a script should convey um and uh sort of what that language is like 
I love that. I think it's so useful, even as a consumer. Yeah. It's useful to know, because I love digging into the history or digging into, like you mentioned, the Marvel method, digging into how that was or, you know, originated. Mm-hmm. So even being a consumer, I think it's really cool to learn the process in case you ever decide you want to do it or just see, you know, be more knowledgeable. So one yeah. thing I noticed that you did that others tend to, um, not always, but sometimes stray away from is you did digital. Was there, were you ever worried about piracy or anything like that? Were you, did it, was it a concern? What made you decide to go digital? I love it. I read everything digitally anymore. I have yeah. for like three years, but just out of curiosity. Yeah. So, I mean, um, the, the main thing is like, uh, you know, I, I have physical copies. That is like the main bulk of, of right. what, uh, what I tend to move, but digital for me was also like just accommodating every type of reader. You know, um, I, I don't want to cut anybody out. Right. Like I don't want anybody to feel like they can't read this book. Um, and so it need like I, I needed to have that as an option for people to be able to read this story the way they want to read it. Um, and yeah, piracy maybe is a problem. I think uh, part of it is also me just being aware that like I'm a no name and I don't know how many people would want to pirate my comic. Uh, right. And, and p- partly also if somebody did, I'd be a little bit flattered. Um, <laughs> but but uh, I sort of have this system and, and it's not like it's by no means a foolproof system. It, it's de- There's definitely ways to get around it where um, when I send the digital copies, it's on a, a time to download link. So um, the people oh, can't, that's for example, very smart. People can't spread the link. They have five days to download it. And I make it abundantly clear in the email when I send it out to Kickstarter backers um, that, um, you know, if, if you need to redownload it, because I understand things happen, you get new computers. Maybe you didn't read the email. Email me. I'll send you another timed link. Um, so uh, there is that as a sort of way to deter because then it gets annoying because it's a rather large. I mean, it's it's really high definition, the PDF. So it, it it takes up a lot of space. So for somebody to like take the time to convert it and then and then send it and whatever, you know, how many people are going to really go through all the trouble to pirate a no name comic to that extent? You know, um, so, yeah, it's and, and part of like the thing about piracy is it's sort of unavoidable, you know, like true. That's very true. Um, but I, you know, I just ask and I try to be open and honest with people like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm really pouring a lot of myself, my own time, energy, and money into this. If you like it, if you enjoy it, you know, at bare minimum, like share it around, you know, talk to people who might have the money to, to buy it, uh, about contributing because, um, I want to make this a thing. Like I, I, I want more than anything to make this an actual career and to be able to continue to tell stories and, uh, to get better, right? Like, at the end of the day, obviously, I don't want anybody to look at this book and go, oh, this is this guy's first comic. Oh, this is a first comic. Like, yeah, somebody's going to look back and go, this is my first comic. But, you know, five years from now, I want to be um, unrecognizable as a writer in a way. Like, I want to be um, that much better than who than than the writer I am now. You know, like, I never want to be complacent. I want to constantly be growing and bettering my craft um, and uh, basically expanding my toolbox as a storyteller. Yeah, that's perfect. I love that. And now I think I might know the answer to this question. Mm-hmm. What and simply by your prices alone, because you're very cheap. <laughs> <laughs> like honestly, I was shocked at what you were charging. What is more important to you when it comes to crowdfunding? Units sold or profit? Um, at this point in the game, I would say units sold. Uh for the sake of exposure, right? Because mm-hmm. at this at this stage, um, I'm not really looking to make any money. I know I'm not really going to make any money. Obviously, I need to make enough to sustain this. But um, at the end of the day, I would much rather, you know, sell a single issue to 500 people than have one person back that crazy, like, let's, I'm, you know, I'll pay for you to travel to New York and I'll deliver your copies to you, this, that, the other thing. Um, I would much rather people experience a story. Like, uh, so this sort of applies on two levels, one on the creative side of a storyteller and two on, on just a logistical side. Um, and I'll start with the, the second, cause I'd rather end on the creative side. Cause that's what I prefer. Um, in terms of the business, like I want more, pe- I want more eyes on the book simply. I want, I want yep. more, more people to engage with the material. That's more word of mouth. Um, and it, and it gives me a lot more opportunity to grow my readership and my audience uh, on the creative side, you know, I, I told a story that means a lot to me and a story that I value and spent a lot of time with and, and the same as my collaborators. And um, most simply, like 
I want to be able to, you know, I want somebody, I want as many people to read this book as possible and to get something out of it and to engage in this like synergistic expression with a reader, right? Because there are things that I'm trying to say, um, but I'm not, I'm not going to like force feed them down anyone's throat. And so part of the fun of this is, is somebody picking up this book and thematically having something resonate with them um, in a whole different way from somebody else, right? Like there, there are a lot of people that really dug uh, the relationship between Kent and his mom. And that was like just me trying to draw from reality and, and make this relationship feel real. But it wasn't something that I was really like having sleepless nights over, you know, in terms of execution. But that was something that resonated with a lot of people. And I find that fascinating. Oh, yeah. That was something that even stood out to me because mm -hmm. I was like, you can feel the love coming from his mother and it and it worked really well. I'm I'm honestly surprised you didn't you didn't expect that because it really really did stand out. It's 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 funny how it all works. You know, the for example, like the thing that I was probably a little bit more conscious about was like when I included the the our father prayer um uh, uh in terms of the the narration, right? Mm -hmm. In uh, the that flashback scene. I was like really, really concerned about that because I was like, oh, will this alienate people? Oh, is this too heavy handed? Oh, like I was really back and forth on that. And, and you know, people really like that moment because it, it adds a sense of uh, it adds a lot of uh, tension and it adds layers of sort of context. Right. Like they're a family uh, in the South. So, of course, there's some uh, denomination of Christian. Yeah. Uh, how would how would a young boy, you know, uh, watching such tragedy um process this well he would probably pray he would pray so desperately to the one thing he thinks could stop this um yep. and and there is also that juxtaposition of religion and science right like we're watching science fiction unfold uh but he's praying to a god um that is considered by many to be a real thing so i i don't know there there was a lot to that and that was the thing you know that was way more meticulous and yet you know a lot of people just really felt um engrossed by the the mother son relationship. And I, I think that's so cool. I think that's so great. And that's exemplary of that sort of expressionism, right? Like this open dialogue that I'm having in a way um, with the reader uh, and, and, and everybody's going to get something different out of it. Yeah. I really, I really enjoyed it. Even to the point where I was like, when he jumps out the window and I'm not going to go into too much depth, but I'm like, who is this bitch? Like, like getting that like <laughs> uh, protective form over somebody, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I interact with comics all the time, but for me to get that reaction, it was pretty oh, big. That's so great. That's, I couldn't be happier to hear that. That's so Good. awesome. Thank you. Now, why did you choose? I know there's a couple different platforms out there. Was there a specific mm -hmm. reason why you chose Kickstarter over the others? Um, yeah. So, I mean, it was, uh, it obviously kind of boiled down to Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Um, right. and the thing with Indiegogo was especially in the beginning with the pandemic and all, I, I honestly, I couldn't afford to like complete the whole thing if it didn't hit its goal. So it, it, in part of it, it did need to be that all or nothing. Um, and at the time I, I felt like at the time Kickstarter might've had more draw because you see, uh, bigger names coming out of Kickstarter. I think, uh, bigger books coming out of Kickstarter at the time. Um, I'm, I'm not unopposed to doing Indiegogo. I've actually considered, you know, down the line once, uh, you know, the, the first prints of these books sell out, maybe doing a second print run, um, on Indiegogo, you know, to make sure that people can still read the material. Uh, but it, it, uh, to be quite honest with you, a lot of it is, is learning as I go, you know, I'll be right. making decisions based on where to house these campaigns. Um, uh, just as, as time goes on, you know, like I, and that's not to be said that like Kickstarter hasn't treated me particularly well, if I'm going to be honest with you, you know, I, uh, I don't get a lot of time on the front page. I don't get a project we love badge. I don't get, uh, into their algorithm, despite the fact that I, I think the book is, um, you know, definitely uh, worthy. <laughs> is a, yeah. Is a considerably professional product, even, even, and not to put anybody else down, even compared to books that do get, um, that sort of exposure that I so very desire, you know? Right. And in, in like putting it in a little bit of perspective for my viewers, I talked about Berserker on my channel. That was huge, right? That was massive mm. on Indiegogo. I didn't particular, I mean, on Kickstarter, I didn't particularly care for it. I would mm. recommend yours Thank over you. that. Thank it's, you. 
yes, that's a that maybe it's because I'm a girl and it and it's all action and blood. But that to me, selling millions seems like it yours. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it just seems to me like something that wasn't just as professional and the storytelling wasn't there as comparatively to yours. Well, thank you. That means a lot to me. Um, and it's it's something it's it's a something that I constantly have to sort of temper myself with, if I'm to be honest with you. It is hard sometimes to look at other people's books that you you might not think uh, are up to the standard and and that are doing better than yours. And it's it's hard to reconcile that sometimes. And I, you know, I, I say this to be honest. I don't say this to like prop myself up. You know, I think like if anything, it, it might make me look like a little bit more of an ass than I'd like to come off. But yeah, it's it is hard to deal with stuff like that. Um and at this point, you know, all I can hope is that I put out the best work I possibly can and work with the most talented people I possibly can. Uh, and that this stuff resonates with people and that, you know, folks like you that are kind enough to spread the word um, and, and put the book in front of people, you know, uh, because, you know, as much as the saying can bring true, the work doesn't always speak for itself. You know, sometimes other right. factors do. And uh, that's why we have a comic book industry for, to be honest with you, um, that does its best with gimmicks right with all these crazy variant covers and oh um, yeah and and like holographics and foil and like while some of that is pretty cool like that i i to me that shouldn't be what sells the book you know i, I want somebody to uh, to you know have the option of maybe a second or a third variant cover um and you know to to support it if what is inside the book is worth their time and money um and that might not be a philosophy that caters well to the market that we're in, but that's the philosophy that I carry. Yeah. I, and I completely agree with you. I've only, I've had my channel for nearly three years. This is only the third crowdfunded mm -hmm. project. I've personally put my name behind, you know what I mm -hmm. mean? So it, it's very rare for me to back that. Now I've got one last com or one last question here. Now that we're talking about creator owned, yeah. you have your personal favorite creator owned property. That's not, of course your own. Mm -hmm. Oof. Oh, that's a good question. Um, and I wouldn't say my own because there's like a million other things that are better than what I can do right now, to be honest. Um, but oh, my favorite creator own. Let me look back at the bookshelf for two seconds. Um, let's see. You know what? It's not like a whole franchise. But something that's really resonated with me uh, was uh, Ram V. Anandar K. and uh, John Pearson's Blue and Green. It came out last year as an original graphic novel out of Image. And it's not like this franchise or this world that will probably ever be continued. Um, but in terms of like indie comics, it's it's a book that resonated with me like crazy. And it to me is a, a master class in how to make um, a comic. It's an auteur's comic. It's It's truly incredible. Just on every level, from from Ram V's uh, writing and the way he is able to weave in and pay off theme and create a sense of uh, existential crisis to like Anand Arke's layouts and the way he's telling the story and the way he's using like uh, impressionism to develop a sense of mood. And then John Pearson kind of goes over um, with these painterly colors that just frame everything. I mean, I don't have enough positive things to say about it. Uh, blue and green. I know I'm like supposed to promote my book, but this is brilliant. If you guys haven't, I've never Blue even Green. heard of it. Oh, Tristan, it's. I'm sorry, I'm like hitting my mic. I'm so excited. Oh, you're fine. It's so good. It's so good, and even down to the cover design. I mean, I think this is simply great. Just oh simply, yeah, but and I love Ram V. He's so talented. Um, so there's good. so much like he can't do any wrong. I can't believe I've never heard of it. I'm gonna have to check that out. That's awesome. I'm glad. Even I, you know pick something up in this interview yeah. here definitely um there's so many good ones out and i noticed you know in the industry right now a lot of people seem to be flocking to that and mm -hmm. i and i think that's smart that's the best way to go because you're never gonna own you know even with stuff like tinian's creating punchline mm -hmm. or miracle molly yes he created them and he may get royalties but they're never his Right. And and but you can go to stuff like Nactura or Geiger and those are mm -hmm. owned by them. And I think it's probably the smartest thing that that creators like yourself should do. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing we're seeing, um, 
you know, it's 20, oh God, 30 years after like the uh, original image boom. And I think we're seeing it in a much smarter way now. Now we're seeing an image. Oh, boom absolutely. Like image meets old school DC vertigo. Um, and, and these creators are just going out and doing incredible things. I mean, Scott Snyder just announced like this eight or nine book. Oh my God. Slate. With comiXology. I'm yeah. With, with comiXology Ouch. and dark horse, like that, that's the future of comics. I mean, this is a guy who, um, is, is at the top of his notoriety could do anything for any publisher he wants. If he said, Marvel, give me all of your characters. Marvel would give them all of their characters, <laughs> exactly. you know? Um, and he, and he goes off and creates this slew right of like genre comics i mean you got a western you got a historical fiction romance you got a horror you got like a high octane uh uh creepy book you got an old school war horror you got uh, a, a sort of 60s 70s like nuclear romp akin to like challengers or uh or uh, legion you know like he's doing like it, that's like a creator's dream uh to oh, me oh yeah and he's bringing in huge names greg capullo and jock and like, that's a massive deal. I think that's going to, I think it's going to pay off. I really do. I know it's a big risk, but yeah. big risk, big reward. Absolutely. And even like, I mean, Jesus, I, I mean, I'm not the biggest, um, like, early image characters guy, but like, Spawn is bigger than he's been in like 25 years. Oh, yeah. You know? Got the Spawn universe now. And uh, it, it's amazing. I love it. So ending out here, I'm going yeah. to put the links to everything in the description and in the pinned comment. But one last little push here. What makes yours special? I know I kind of asked that earlier, but mm. what makes, why should they spend the money? You know, uh, if I'm to be honest, I think the reason people should consider giving this book is because it's, it's made by a creative team that cares and that puts their blood, sweat and tears into this. It's a book that I want on every level to be worth your time, your energy and money. I'm not making this simply as a fan who wants to fill some fantasy of creating a comic book. I'm not making this as somebody um, who uh, is, is just doing it to do it. I'm making this because I, you know, I'm a storyteller and I want to tell a story that is entertaining and that will frighten you and scare you and make you fall in love with it. Uh, and that will break your heart. Uh, and I want to do all of that within uh, a story that matters to me, right? Like a story about very real things that we go through that's wrapped in sci-fi noir and, and murder and conspiracy. Like, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's a story about, like I said earlier, it's about identity. It's a very real thing that we all have to deal with. It's about memory and the way that we reconcile with our memories. It's, it's about, you know, the, the relationship between father and son. Um, it, 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 these things are universal. Uh, and I'm doing my best to be as deliberate as I possibly can at creating an experience and a physical product, right? Because you, you know, I'm asking people to spend money on this. Um, that is more than worth it. You know, as, as Tristan said, um, my books are cheap. My books are really cheap and that's at the cost of my own dollar. And it's because I so desperately want you guys watching this right now to give the book a chance and to love it. And if you don't love it, that's okay. And I will uh, uh, appreciate, you know, your support and you giving it a chance and, and giving me a chance to tell these stories. But at the end of the day, I want to make sure that this is satisfying uh, in every way I can possibly make it. And if that comes at the cost of of my my sanity, you know, in creating and pouring <laughs> myself into this book or my dollar, if that's what I have to do to to make a reader out of you, then I'll do it. Because I think the story is worth your time. It's worth your energy. It's worth your money. You know, I've spent uh, all of the above uh, forming a team from all around the world, all around the world. I got, I got, I'm working with talented people in Brazil, in Spain, in, 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 you know, another tri-state area, uh, state New Jersey. You know, it's, um, it's, it's painstaking. The, the process of making this thing. And and the only way to satisfy that is to, to hear from people like Tristan or, or whoever else, you know, decides to give this a chance to let me know what they think about it, man. I, I, I think what makes this special is that truly, and, and I say this uh, like hard in hand is that I care. I care about this book. I care about the industry. I care about stories uh, and I care about the readers. Perfect answer. I love it. And shout out to Joe's geek show who didn't he do the trailer? Yeah, so Joey. Oh, actually, so good. 
Yeah, Joey actually also helped me design the logo for Area 51, the Helix Project. So uh, shout out to Joey. If you guys um, need a, a really friendly, helpful person to to do any graphic work, um, you can find him on great. social media. Joe's Geek Show. Good dude um, uh, with with a, a, a desire to uh, constantly to just make the best thing he possibly can. So I'm glad. Yeah, you met I've him. been watching his channel for a while. He did great. I was surprised. That's amazing. So thank you guys for listening. Make sure again. Check out his book, check out his channel, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.